Thank you for joining this virtual presentation of the Oregon Board of Pharmacy's Pharmacist in Charge, or PIC, training program. This video is part two of a three-part series. The program was last revised in April 2024 and is designed to provide you with an overview of the Oregon Board of Pharmacy statutes and rules that pertain to the responsibilities of a pharmacist in charge. It is important to note that while we strive to keep this training current with applicable laws and rules, you are ultimately responsible for following the most current and effective laws and rules. In any instance where there's a conflict between the information presented here and the effective laws and rules, the laws and rules take precedence. This module will focus on inspections and investigations. PICs should be prepared for potential inspections and investigations. We'll outline the procedures and expectations during such events. In this section, we're going to talk about inspections, both self-inspections and inspections completed by a compliance officer in your pharmacy. The board publishes a self-inspection form on its website each year. Agency staff update the forms based on trends noticed during inspections, compliance cases, and new laws and rules. The purpose of the self-inspection form is to ensure the pharmacy is compliant with state and federal laws and rules governing the practice of pharmacy. I'm going to go over what these forms are, what their intention is, and what to expect during an inspection. The self-inspection forms are multiple pages, and you can think of it like an open book test. During an inspection, compliance officers use the self-inspection form as a guide. Completed self-inspection forms must be retained on-site at the drug outlet and be readily available. All self-inspection forms can be completed electronically. Make sure to complete the current version of this year's inspection form by July 1st each year and within 15 days of becoming a PIC. As a new PIC, you'll have the opportunity to see your pharmacy with fresh eyes. Don't assume that the way it's always been is compliant. Take the time to go through the form one question at a time and ensure that you meet the requirement of each rule cited. The form should be a working document and you should review it periodically for accuracy. Please be aware that if your pharmacy compounds sterile or non-sterile products, there is a separate supplemental compounding self-inspection form that must be completed in addition to the PIC self-inspection form specific to your drug outlet type. If non-FDA approved compounded first kits are being dispensed from your pharmacy, the preparation is considered compounding and you must comply with rules for compounding and complete the compounding self-inspection form. This is a list of all the types of self-inspection forms that are available. There are forms for pharmacy drug outlets like community retail pharmacies and hospital pharmacies, and for non-pharmacy drug outlets like dispensing practitioners and correctional facilities. There's an asterisk by the compounding form as a reminder that this form must also be completed in addition to your drug outlet form if you perform compounding at your drug outlet. Listed on this slide are the different areas that will be inspected, and they will be sectioned out this way on the self-inspection form. Some topics covered on the community, retail, or long-term care self-inspection form include the location of required documents, controlled substances, support personnel, drug storage, prescriptive authority. Each year when the forms are updated, hot topics are added to the form that are pertinent at the time of publication. Some topics covered on the inpatient or hospital institutional self-inspection form include automated dis distribution cabinets or ADCs, floor stock, non-emergency trays and kits, absence of a pharmacist, collaborative drug therapy management, medication history and reconciliation, drug storage. There are some additional sections if the hospital has a retail registration for things like dispensing, e-emergency room, prepacks, 
If the hospital has a traditional retail pharmacy and dispenses prescriptions to the public beyond ED prepacks, the PIC must also complete the retail self inspection form. Counseling is one of the most important duties of a pharmacist. OAR 855-115-0145 outlines the patient counseling requirements. Pharmacists must determine the specific amount and manner of counseling, whether that be oral, written, or electronic, that is needed for each prescription on a case-by-case -case basis. In certain situations, counseling is mandatory and must be provided or offered to the patient or their agent. When a medication is dispensed for the first time at the drug outlet pharmacy, counseling is mandatory. When there's a change in the dose, formulation, or directions for an existing medication. When a prescription is transferred to the drug outlet from another pharmacy, regardless of the method of transfer. For any refill where the pharmacist deems counseling is necessary based on potential risk or patient needs, all these items will need counseling or the offer to counsel. While pharmacists ultimately provide counseling, the initial offer for counseling under paren one and two in the rule can be made by any licensed staff member in the pharmacy. Non-licensed staff, such as pharmacy clerks, may not make an offer for the pharmacist to counsel. In paren four, regardless of the mandatory situations, pharmacists must always honor the patient's request for counseling on any medication or device. Pharmacists must ensure communication accessibility for patients who prefer languages other than English or who use signed language. When the pharmacist is not proficient in the patient's preferred language, they must seek the assistance of a qualified healthcare interpreter registered with the Oregon Health Authority. When counseling is provided solely in writing, the pharmacist must ensure the information is accessible to the patient, which includes clear and understandable language and an appropriate format for the patient with contact information that clearly states when the pharmacist is available for questions and how the patient can reach them. In paren seven, patients have the right to refuse pharmacist counseling. However, there are important considerations. If counseling is mandatory, only licensed staff can accept a patient's refusal. Ensuring proper documentation and communication with the prescriber is necessary. Any licensed staff member may accept a patient's refusal for pharmacist consultation. Pharmacists still have the discretion to withhold dispensing the medication until counseling is completed, especially if they have concerns about patient safety or medication misuse potential. Pharmacists must always uphold patient privacy and confidentiality during counseling sessions. Counseling offers to counsel or declinations of counseling regarding prescriptions must be documented with the licensee's identity. This means that if a technician makes the offer for a pharmacist to counsel, the technician's identity must be documented as the licensee who made the offer. If the pharmacist then counsels, the pharmacist identity must be documented. And if the patient declines the offer of counseling, the identity of the licensee who accepted the declination must also be documented. In paren 10, when required by federal laws or regulations, pharmacists must provide additional forms of drug information to supplement counseling. This can include items like medication guides and patient package inserts that are part of the FDA's approved prescription drug label for those certain drugs. This is a sample of some of the questions you will see on the self-inspection form for retail, home infusion, or long-term care. On the self-inspection forms, you'll see the question followed by a rule citation. Please use the rule citation as a reference to determine if your answer to the question complies with the rule. So for question A, does the pharmacist offer or provide counseling on all new prescriptions and refills when determined necessary? Note, asking the patient if they have any questions does not fulfill this requirement. Question B, 
How does the pharmacist denote that a new or refilled prescription requires the offer or provision of counseling? The PIC needs to explain how this is done by documenting it in the space provided. Question C, does the pharmacist include all information necessary to promote safe use of the medication or device? Using their professional judgment, only a pharmacist can determine the manner and amount of counseling that is reasonable or necessary. Question D, are counseling activities, so the offer, provision, or declination of counseling, documented in real time, including the identity of the licensee involved? This is a common observation made during inspections. If you work at a pharmacy that uses stickers or a form to document counseling, Make sure that you are documenting counseling at the time and not saving it for the end of the day. Chances are a compliance officer will walk into your pharmacy in the middle of the day. Controlled substances and the duties of a PIC. Controlled substance losses occur, sometimes by accident and sometimes on purpose. You must be aware of the deviations in your controlled substance inventory. As PIC, you are responsible for identifying losses and implementing policies and procedures to prevent future loss from recurring. OAR 855-115-0210 requires an inventory with reconciliation of all Schedule II controlled drugs at least every 31 days in an institutional pharmacy and every 91 days in a retail pharmacy. These records must be available for inspection upon request and retained for three years. Please note that various types of drug outlets may have more stringent rules. The inventory and reconciliation is always a focus in inspections. Each discrepancy should be resolved and documented in a way that anyone can understand. PICs should show their math when reconciling a controlled substance issue. There should be a known starting quantity of the controlled substance, addition of all the controlled substances that were ordered since that date, and then a subtraction of all quantities that were dispensed since the date to tally the final on-hand quantity. Many PICs have found it helpful to back count after each controlled substance dispensing, which allows for real-time corrections to occur. Another helpful procedure is to regularly review on-hand controlled substance quantity adjustments to ensure they make sense and are supported by solid documentation. As a recommendation, it is much easier to reconcile a month's worth of invoices and prescriptions that are dispensed than reconciling 90 days worth. If diversion is occurring at your pharmacy, it may be identified much earlier if you're performing monthly reconciliations. This is a suggestion only. The rule requires at least a quarterly inventory reconciliation of C2s for retail drug outlets and monthly for institutional drug outlets. C3 through 5 monthly and quarterly reconciliations are not required by this rule, but they are highly recommended. Board staff have also seen some pharmacies pick random C3 through 5s to spot check to ensure and accurate inventory counts. General reporting requirements for pharmacists are outlined in OAR 855-115-0115. Specific requirements for pharmacies concerning drug loss are outlined in OAR 855-041-1030. In general, violations of pharmacy laws and rules must be reported within 10 days. But for a significant drug loss or violation related to drug theft, the pharmacist must notify the board within one business day. Board rules mirror the DEA's rules. In 21 CFR 1301.76, a pharmacy must notify in writing the local DEA diversion field office one business day a discovery of a theft of, or significant loss of a controlled substance. Everyone asks, what is a significant loss? If you lose a bottle of, for example, Adderall, and identify the loss as insignificant, you'll be asked to justify why it was determined insignificant. 
On the flip side, one tablet may be significant if it goes missing from a medication bottle that was quarantined or outdated and has not been dispensed since its last count. Although the rules do not defer, define the term significant loss, it is the responsibility of the pharmacist to use their best judgment to take appropriate action. Whether a significant loss has occurred depends in large part on the business of the pharmacy and the likelihood of a rational explanation for a particular occurrence. What would constitute a significant loss for a community pharmacy may be viewed as comparatively insignificant for a hospital or vice versa. Further, the loss of a small quantity of controlled substances repeated over a period of time may indicate a significant problem for a pharmacy, which must be reported. The burden of responsibility is on the registrant to identify what is a significant loss and to make the required report to the DEA. When determining whether a loss is significant, the registrant should consider, among others, the following factors the actual quantity of controlled substances loss in relation to the type of business, the specific controlled substances loss, whether the loss of the controlled substances can be associated with access to those controlled substances by specific individuals, or whether the loss can be attributed to unique activities that may take place involving the controlled substances. Again, a pattern of losses over a specific time period, whether the losses appear to be random, and results of efforts taken to resolve the losses. And if known, whether the specific controlled substances are likely candidates for diversion. You should also look at local trends and other indicators of diversion potential of the missing controlled substances. If it's determined that the loss is not significant, it would be prudent to document the, the investigation and file it for future reference. Miscounts or adjustments to inventory involving clerical errors on the part of the pharmacy should not be reported on a DEA Form 106, but rather should be noted as separate log at the pharmacy management's discretion. Be prepared to justify why you didn't report and show documentation. Also, if there is a loss, what progressive steps are being taken to prevent reoccurrence? One of the biggest cases the board has heard was a pharmacist who received a C2 order, identified and documented that all CT C2s ordered and invoiced were actually received by documenting on the 222 form and circling the drug on the invoice. But then they went in and adjusted the order in the pharmacy software to indicate that less was ordered and therefore received. This went on for about 10 months before the behavior was identified. Don't allow yourself as the PIC to be put in this situation. Have tight inventory control and look at who is making on-hand quantity adjustments. Double check that the controlled substances received were added correctly to the on-hand quantity in your pharmacy software. When your patients tell you that their prescription was shorted, don't discount their allegation. The board has also heard cases of diversion from patients' prescription vials, Luckily, this is rare, but just know that it does happen. I know we're talking about controlled substances right now, but don't miss what OAR 855-041-1030 paren 1 states. It's not just loss that has to be reported to the board. Any disaster, accident, and emergency that may affect the drug strength, purity, or labeling like power outages that result in improper storage conditions or flooding that reaches the drug product must be immediately reported to the board. When things are bolded and underlined on the self-inspection form, it is our way of conveying to licensees that we have often noted observations with these items during an inspection, and these statements or questions should grab your attention. In question A, is the PIC pharmacist pharmacy reporting theft or significant loss of a controlled substance to the board and the DEA within one business day? Despite what your company policy is with regards to reporting theft or drug loss to the board, under OAR 855-104-0010, you have the duty to report. The board has fined drug outlets $5,000 for not reporting drug theft to the board office within one business day. Question B, is the pharmacy identifying and clearly documenting and explaining all variances on C2 reconciliations? 
Simply providing an on-hand count is not sufficient to meet this requirement. The board considers a reconciliation to be an accurate accounting of the outlet's true inventory performed at least every 93 days in a retail drug outlet and every 31 days in an institutional drug outlet. Question C, on an annual inventory must be conducted at least every 367 days. These extra days allow the pharmacy to schedule it on a weekend every year or the same date every year without having to back up by one day each year. Question D, how does the pharmacy or pharmacist maintain the security of controlled substances that have been quarantined? Outdated controlled substances should be removed from the pharmacy as soon as possible, whether by use of a reverse distributor or some other means. Diversion from outdated medications has occurred, and it hasn't been limited to controlled substances, where there, there was a case where Cialis disappeared from the outdates. Hospital regulations for controlled substances differ slightly from retail regulations. The additional regulations are listed in OAR 855-041-6600 through OAR 855-041-6620. The hospital must have policies and procedures for controlled substances with the requirements shown on the slide in A through F. Controlled substance drugs must be in a separately locked, secured compartment, except in the case of a facility using single unit packaged drug distribution systems. A missing dose needs to be readily detectable. In paren three, delivery receipts must be maintained for all controlled drugs supplied as floor stock and records of controlled substance administration from floor stock must be kept and returned to the PIC or their designee monthly and meet the requirements of paren A through E on the slide. Some of the language in the rule is a little outdated, but the general concepts are still applicable. Here's a snapshot of some questions about controlled substances on the institutional drug outlet form. Again, if you have questions as to whether your outlet is compliant, review the rule. Where there are open-ended questions, explain or attach your policy. Let's look specifically at question B on the slide. Is there a quality assurance procedure for the random sampling of C2 inventory performed at least quarterly, which includes auditing of dose-by-dose -dose administration? The board has had multiple cases in which dose-by-dose -dose administration audits were not performed and ultimately diversion was identified. For example, anesthesia trays were made by the central pharmacy that contained ephedrine. The trays would come back from the floor and no one was checking that the quantity of ephedrine missing from the return trays was accounted for in the patient's medical record. Be familiar with your outlet's policy and identify in the space provided on the self-inspection form where the compliance officer can find these records. If you're going to be the PIC in a hospital setting, we recommend that you know your automated distribution cabinets, commonly Pixis and OmniCell. For example, how soon after the drawers closed does it lock? A big diversion case in California found that nurses could access the Pixis for up to two minutes after the drawer was closed. In that time, the user had already left the area and two nurses were accessing drugs under the previous user's credentials. Does the Pixis require blind count of controlled substances? If you tell the Pixis that you counted 10 oxycodone, but there should be 15, who is notified, how quickly, and how soon is the discrepancy reconciled? Who has access to the Pixis? How soon is access denied after someone's employment is terminated? This was another case. A pharmacist accessed the Pixis for about five hours after their employment was terminated, resulting in diversion. Is access to the Pixis limited to certain areas or is there access to every cabinet within the facility? Is anyone reviewing access records? Does it make sense that a PICU nurse is accessing the ED's Pixis machine when they only work in the PICU? 
OAR 855-041-3200 through OAR 855-041-3250 permits a pharmacy intern or technician to work remotely under the supervision of a pharmacist at a secured off-site non-pharmacy location on behalf of a drug outlet. Note that these rules do not apply to a pharmacist, as a pharmacist may practice pharmacy from any location as long as they comply with all pharmacy laws and rules. Board inspections are critical to assess the compliance of pharmacies with board regulations. To ensure the safety of patients and for the board to meet its required purpose in ORS 689-025, which is to promote, preserve, and protect public health, safety, and welfare by and through the effective control and regulation of the practice. In addition, in ORS 689155, the State Board of Pharmacy must also have the following responsibilities in regard to medications, drugs, devices, and other materials used in this state in the diagnosis, mitigation, and treatment or prevention of injury, illness, and disease. Her intent specifically authorizes regular inspection of all pharmacies. We understand that pharmacies are busy and minimizing disruptions during inspections is a priority for us. That's why we provide a two week window for your upcoming inspection, communicated two to four weeks in advance to the pharmacist in charge and the outlet's inspection contact via their eGov email addresses. It's crucial that your PIC and your outlet inspection email addresses are current in eGov. This ensures you receive timely notification of your inspection window. When you receive an inspection notification, here's what you can do to prepare. Review the requested documents and make sure they're easily accessible. Talk to your staff about what to expect and assign someone to assist the compliance officer if the pharmacist in charge is unavailable. Gather the requested documents before the inspection date. Keep everything organized that will save time and will reduce stress for everyone involved. The time to complete an inspection varies greatly and depends on several factors, including the services that are provided at the pharmacy. For example, compounding, pharmacist prescribing, vaccinations, collaborative drug therapy agreements, etc. The ease of finding documents and how busy your staff is, meaning is your pharmacy staff able to assist in the inspection? By being prepared, you can help ensure a smooth and efficient inspection. This allows us to do our job effectively while minimizing disruption to your daily operations. Historically, compliance officers issued deficiency notices and non-compliance notices at the end of an inspection. They no longer do this. At the conclusion of the inspection, the compliance officer will verbally review observations they made with the pharmacist on duty, which will be documented on the inspection report. An observation is any potential regulatory violation found during the inspection. Possible outcomes of an inspection include a no response needed. This means that there were no observations made or the observations that were made were completely corrected in real time. In this case, a completed inspection report will be provided to the PIC and to the outlet's inspection contact. The report will come within a few weeks following the inspection. The other possible outcome is a response needed. This means that there were observations made at the time of inspection that require a response from the PIC. In this case, the PIC will receive further communication from the compliance officer regarding the inspection via email. These communications tend to take a little longer to send out. When the outcome of the inspection is response needed, a case number will be assigned for tracking purposes. The PIC will be notified via their work email that a corrective action response is required within a 30-day deadline. The PIC needs to return their response to the compliance officer with the corrective actions that were taken for each observation. If you believe that an observation is incorrect, please provide and include this information in your response 
as to why this observation was an error and provide the documentation that supports your claim. This will be assessed, and if appropriate, the observation will be marked as resolved on the inspection port report and will no longer be considered an active observation. If you need additional time to provide a response, please reach out to the compliance officer and request an extension. After sufficient corrective action responses are received, the case will be added to the next applicable board meeting packet. The PIC and the Allitts inspection contact will receive a notification that includes information on which board meeting the case will be reviewed by the board and a copy of the completed inspection report. All cases are reviewed by the board at an upcoming board meeting that's determined by submission deadlines. Timely and complete responses to the compliance officer will help a case to be reviewed by the board sooner. At the meeting, the board will assess the inspection and the corrective action responses to determine whether or not discipline is warranted. Please be aware that the board's review considers who was responsible for the observation. At each board meeting during an open session, there is a time when motions related to disciplinary actions are read out loud. You can join the board meeting in person or virtually to listen for the case number and hear the board's decision on if discipline will be issued. In addition, several weeks post board meeting, the PIC and the outlet inspection contact will receive written notification of the board's decision. Let's discuss the potential outcomes following a board meeting. There are three main paths depending on the board's decision. First is case closure. If the board votes to close the case, any related information will not become part of a public record and will not be published on the board's website. This essentially means that the matter is resolved. The next option is a letter of education. Sometimes the board issues these letters. The letter will not become public record or published online either. Think of it as a formal notice highlighting areas for improvement without official disciplinary action. The last option is discipline. If the board decides to issue discipline, things change. This could involve civil penalties, suspensions, or even revocations. Discipline becomes a public record and is published on the board's website, serving as a transparency measure. Remember, this is just a general overview. Each case is unique and the board's decision will depend on the specific circumstances. Common observations made by compliance officers during an inspection of a retail pharmacy include incomplete or missing records for counseling, which employee provided counseling or who accepted the de declination of counseling, employee training, staff are unable to locate documentation of training at the time of inspection, controlled substance reconciliations. Remember, it's not just the inventory that's needed, but the reconciliation too. Missing or incomplete or inaccurate vaccine administration records. And relabeled drugs lacking the pharmacist initials to indicate their review. Sometimes they observe improper medication handling. They'll find expired drugs on your shelves or improperly labeled medications where the expiration date on the label is greater than the actual product's expiration date or the drug is expired and on the shelf ready to be dispensed. Um, compliance officers also will uncover temperature excursions. These excursions typically lack a proper response or documentation, so they're missing data or references to validate the decisions. Or there's an unawareness of excursions that occurred and the pharmacy just continued dispensing affected drugs. And last but not least, compliance officers have observed instances where pharmacists prescribed outside of the defined protocols, such as prescribing birth control for patients with high blood pressure or a migraine with aura. Common observations by compliance officers during inspection of an institutional or hospital pharmacy include some of the same observations as retail. Inadequate documentation related to temperature excursions, missing reports or missing or incomplete reconciliations, 
They also have found expired drugs and floor stock or multi-dose vials that do not have an appropriate expiration date and after they have been accessed. And technicians having access to patient records before a pharmacist is on site. If the pharmacy does sterile compounding, we found policies and procedures that are not being followed, ongoing training and media field testing that is incomplete or late, failed hood certifications but continuing to compound, missing cleaning documentation for ISO areas, not responding to bacterial growth in clean rooms, failure to garb correctly, and wearing makeup in clean rooms. Now let's move on from inspections and discuss investigations. Shown on this slide is a flow chart regarding the investigatory process. Bottom line, this process is tied to patient safety. When an allegation or complaint is received by the board, such as a dispensing error, drug diversion, or unprofessional conduct, the complaint is reviewed by agency staff for its potential of a violation and a priority is assessed. A complaint that is a current threat to patient safety, like a potentially impaired licensee on duty, is going to take a higher priority versus something that occurred in the past. The complaint is assigned to an investigator, which is called a compliance officer, and they gather evidence. I'll go into the gathering evidence process on the next slide, but for now, let's keep walking through the big picture process. Based on the information gathered, the compliance officer will create an investigative report. This report is reviewed by the Assistant Attorney General, who is a lawyer that works for the Oregon Department of Justice. Then, the board reviews the case report and evidence gathered. The board determines discipline or decides to close the case. The licensee is notified of the discipline and their rights via a notice of proposed disciplinary action and accompanying consent order. Ideally, the licensee will agree to the consent order. However, the licensee can request a hearing as outlined in the notice, and then the case is referred to the Department of Justice. If the case is not settled prior to hearing, then a hearing occurs with an administrative law judge or ALJ presiding. The ALJ provides recommendations on the proposed order. The board then reviews the ALJ's opinion and writes a final order. This process can take months, even years if it goes through all the steps. The board meets every other month. Investigating the complaint takes time, getting responses back from licensees takes time, writing the investigative report takes time, the AAG's review of the case takes time. The board's review of the case may actually be one of the quickest steps in the process, and then creating the communications post-board meeting takes time. If no discipline is proposed, notification of the board's decision may take four or more weeks. If the board proposes disciplinary action, notification regarding the decision is made by the board via U.S. certified mail. Please note that the average processing time for decisions to be mailed is approximately eight to 12 weeks after the board meeting. To receive the documents being mailed by the board, the U.S. Postal Service requires that you sign for the certified mail upon delivery. Then requesting a hearing takes time, scheduling a hearing takes time, the ALJ's review of the case takes time, and then the ALJ's opinion has to go back to the board, which takes more time. Also, please be aware that an investigation can be started due to information provided or omitted on an application for licensure. If you offer employment to an unlicensed person and the licensure process is taking longer than expected, the applicant may have a case pending as a result of their application. So what do you need to do when you receive a communication from a compliance officer regarding a complaint? First, know that the compliance officer may contact you via phone, email, or mail at your personal residence or at the outlet. When you receive a written request for information, read the request. It's going to say something like, the Oregon Board of Pharmacy is investigating a complaint regarding a prescription dispensed from ABC Drugs. The complaint is that on or about April 1st, ABC Drugs sold patient A's prescription to the wrong person. 
The complaint includes that patient A attempted to pick up their prescription and was unable to because the pharmacy dispensed their prescription to an unknown person. As PIC, please respond by submitting a typed and signed statement directly to the board by April 15th. The report or the letter must include the case number, the date the statement is written, your name is signature, your license number, and if the allegation is true. It is also crucial to explain in detail why the incident happened and describe any steps taken to prevent this type of incident from reoccurring. In addition, the PIC is to provide a response by number to the items listed below, and then there'll be a list of items. This list could include a list of responsible pharmacy staff, a copy of the prescription in question, any prescription or profile notes associated with the prescription in question, documentation for each step of the filling process that identifies the date, time, and responsible individual, documentation of the prescription in question being picked up, a copy of the patient's prescription profile, a copy of the patient's demographics, drug outlet policies and procedures that were in place at the time pertaining to the matter. Please note, responses are the formal statement to the board's inquiry in this investigation. The board may use information provided in your response statements to determine whether disciplinary action is warranted. And then it's going to have contact information for your compliance officer. Please read the request. It's going to summarize the complaint. It will tell you what to do and when and how to respond. And there may be a list of items being requested. There will also be contact information for your compliance officer. Respond to the request within the timeline requested fully and completely. The board is aware that licensees are receiving scam phone calls and faxes from individuals impersonating Oregon Board of Pharmacy staff members. Licensees should be cautious of giving confidential or payment information over the phone without verifying that the source is legitimate as agency staff will never ask for or accept payment for any fees by phone. Scammers claiming to be Board of Pharmacy staff members are calling pharmacists and saying that their facility or their individual license is under investigation. They may also state that they are working with the Food and Drug Administration or the DEA on a case and further will claim that your license is under investigation for suspicious activity or drug trafficking. In either case, the scammers claim that licensees will face disciplinary action, a revoked license or arrest if they do not immediately pay a fine over the phone. Additionally, many scammers are spoofing the phone number called used to call the pharmacist. Spoofing involves disguising the caller's true phone number and making it appear that the phone number is from a legitimate source. Scammers may even give a fake name and a fraudulent inspector identification number as proof of identity. If the call sounds suspicious, be polite, but hang up and call the board directly or contact the board via email. As a last Licensee, you have a duty to report any suspected violation of our laws and rules, ORS 475689, ORS 689, and OAR 855. Remember that the board holds your license that allows you to practice at any outlet. Your employer may require you to report concerns or suspected violations to them, but you still have a duty to report to the board despite what your HR or loss prevention might say. Let's look a little more into the rules concerning duty to report. These rules apply to all licensees. If you as a licensee have reasonable cause to believe that another licensee of our board or of another licensing board has engaged in prohibited or unprofessional conduct, which I'll go over in the next couple of slides, then you must report that conduct to the board responsible for the licensee. You must report without undue delay, but not later than 10 working days. In addition, for resident pharmacies, you need to be aware that if you or your employer terminates or allows a board licensee to resign in lieu of termination, then you must report the termination or resignation to the board within 10 working days. 
If someone other than you says they're going to report it, then it would be wise to ask for a copy of the report or also report it yourself. So what is prohibited conduct? Prohibited conduct is a criminal act against a patient or client that creates harm to a patient or client. And what is unprofessional conduct? Well, it can mean a lot of things, but is conduct unbecoming of a licensee or detrimental to the best interest of the public? That is, conduct contrary to recognized standards of ethics of pharmacy or that endangers the health, safety, or welfare of a patient or client. Some examples of unprofessional conduct include any type of fraud or misrepresentation. Examples of this are listed in paren A through G on the slide. Unprofessional conduct also includes any illegal use of drugs, medications, or devices without a practitioner's prescription, or otherwise contrary to federal or state law or regulation, and any use of intoxicants, drugs, or controlled substances that endangers or could endanger the licensee or others. An obvious example of is diversion or working while intoxicated. A couple of less common examples a pharmacist can't use a dab of triamcinolone cream from the bulk tub on their rash or take a unit dose ibuprofen 600 milligram for their headache. In paren D, theft of drugs, medications, or devices, or theft of any other property or services under circumstances which bear a demonstrable relationship to the practice of pharmacy. This could include loading gift cards for personal use and time card fraud. In paren E, dispensing a drug, medication, or device where the pharmacist knows or should know due to the apparent circumstances that the purported prescription is bogus or that the prescription is issued for other than a legitimate medical purpose. Unprofessional conduct also includes any act or practice relating to the practice of pharmacy that's prohibited by the state or federal law or regulation the disclosure of confidential information in violation of board rules. Both paren F and G could be violating HIPAA. Another example would be a technician who called a patient to ask her out using the phone number in her pharmacy profile. Licensees are reminded to refrain from posting patient information, including chart notes, signatures, treatment plans, patient tracking boards, on any form of social media, de-identified or otherwise. In paren H, engaging in collaborative drug therapy management in violation of ORS 689 and the rules of the board. This might include a pharmacist using a collaborative drug therapy agreement at a location that is not included in the agreement, or a pharmacist performing an exam that is not included in the agreement. In paren I, authorizing or permitting any pharma person to practice pharmacy in violation of the Oregon Pharmacy Act or rules of the board. This is, um, includes allowing a technician to perform the duties of a pharmacist. The most common example of this is a pharmacist allowing a technician to parrot counseling information to a patient. This is also referred to as a pass-through counseling scenario. In paren J, any conduct or practice by a licensee or registrant which the board determines is contrary to accepted standards of practice. This rule is kind of the catch-all bucket for behavior that's inconsistent with what the prudent pharmacist would do. But a specific example might be a pharmacist speaking negatively about a patient and the patient or another patient overhearing the information. In paren K, failure to cooperate with the board pursuant to OAR 855-001-0035. Unfortunately, this occurs when a board compliance officer reaches out to a licensee for information and the licensee fails to respond to the compliance officer. To recap, here's a quick reference list of timelines for reporting. There are different timelines as many of these rules were implemented due to different statutory requirements. You have 15 business days for a change of address, work site, or other demographic information like your email. Bottom line, the board needs to be able to contact you. You have 10 working days for a pharmacy licensee or another healthcare provider suspected violation of law 
or rule or unprofessional conduct to their board. If you suspect that one of your employees had violated a law or rule of the Board of Pharmacy, you have 10 working days to report them to the board. If you or your pharmacy terminates an employee or the employee resigns in lieu of termination, this must also be reported to the board within 10 working days. You have 10 days for felony arrest or conviction of a misdemeanor or felony, one day for any significant drug loss or theft, and immediately if you have concerns about child abuse. You are a mandatory reporter and must report the abuse immediately to the Oregon Child Abuse Hotline. You have now completed module two. If you have thought of a question, we encourage you to email pharmacy.compliance at bop.organ.gov so the compliance officer on duty can provide a complete response to your inquiry. Please remember that agency staff cannot give legal advice and may not be able to answer your question as it's asked. The program code for this module is PEAR, like the fruit, P-E-A-R. You will need to select this code on the program quiz and evaluation located on the board's PIC webpage. Please note that if you would like to receive a PIC training course completion certificate and continuing pharmacy education, you will need to watch all three modules and then complete the learning assessment quiz and an evaluation of this course. Information on how to access that learning assessment quiz and evaluation will be provided at the end of module three. And again, if you've thought of a question, we encourage you to email it in to pharmacy.compliance at bop.organ.gov. Thank you, and we'll see you at the next module.